and gentlemen, uh, my name is Chuck Sheely. I'm here with Making Music Magazine. I'm content and creative director here. And uh, today we are meeting with very special soloist, chamber musician, and recording artist, Dr. Carmine Miranda. And uh, he's here today to talk to us a little bit about cello, the life of cello, music in general, and a uh, nice life. Uh, good morning, Carmine. How are you today? Good morning. Very well. Thank you uh, for you know taking your time to conduct this interview today. Um, let's get started. All right. Our complete pleasure. Here and away we go. So, question number one, sir. You have a flourishing career. You're acknowledged to be pioneering, and it looks like you're having a blast. You're very busy doing it. Uh, what's your perspective and philosophy on the success of how things are working out for you? Yeah, I, I think that my, my philosophy and, uh, and the way that I was you know, brought up since I was a, a very little kid has always been to uh, remain humble uh, above all things. And I think that humility is a quality that um, not only set, uh, you know, keeps you grounded uh, when you're having a lot of great success, but uh, I, I also think that it's, it's great, you know, for a musician to be approachable to, you know, be down to earth. So, and, and you know, and I always surround myself with, with people that always, you know, <laughs> they, keep me, they keep me very grounded. You know, it might be a Dr. Miranda at school, but I'm, you know, Carmine Miranda, the person at home. And, uh, and I like it like that, you know, to be honest with you. I don't really see myself as a cellist uh, first they see myself as a human being uh, just like everyone else and then you know uh, i'm just a guy who was very passionate about the instrument about music about teaching and recording so everything else is is kind of uh secondary in many ways so that's pretty much how, that has been my approach you know for many years that's a great answer uh, yeah, I myself share a similar thing. Uh, I'm not where you are in the music business, but I always try to be the second best guitar player in my band so that I can keep learning from that same humility, you know? Right. Uh, well, so I think no, it's nobody, very important. Besides that, I, I, don't think that I, I, don't, I don't think that many people like to work with, with a diva, right? So, <laughs> so it makes it also easier, easier to work with, uh, with others as well. Right, right. Um, you spent much of your life on the cello. Uh, what's your view from here, from the pit? You know uh, how things are going, especially with you know COVID and uh, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, well, uh, look, uh, I think that uh, COVID has um, placed many, many challenges for us uh, musicians across the board, not only for cellists but. Uh, you know, for all kinds of genres, uh, pretty much for the arts. Uh, there are a lot of challenges that we're currently battling uh, with and we will have to battle probably as a, as a result of, you know, essentially an entire year or possibly more of not being able to, you know, perform, not being able to, to be uh, close to the people, close to the fans, close, close to the public that we want to be with. Uh, I think that, uh, so that, that's on one end. On the other end, I think that this has brought an opportunity to uh, bring people closer, to bring the community, the musical community closer. Uh, and I think that now is a time where us musicians should be really, really uh, helping each other and uh, trying to find the creative ways to, and, and, and a lot of, look, I mean, a lot of musicians have been, finding lots and lots of creative ways to, you know, to keep the, the ball rolling, uh, whether it is uh, video performances or maybe just staggering, you know, six feet apart uh, on stage and keeping uh, some kind of distance or pre-recording performances and live streaming them online. So what this has also brought uh, to, the, uh, to the plate for us in the, in the arts, uh, you know, in the other, in the other sites are, uh, you know, many new opportunities to, to be able to interact with technology, which I think will, will stick for, for a long time, you know, as we, as we keep uh, progressing and, and, and evolving. Uh, I think that that's the best answer that I can, I can come up with at, at the moment, because to be honest, honest with you, uh, a lot of things 
uh, in terms of the future are uncertain. And, uh, and certainly when this pandemic is going to stop, there is quite a lot of uncertainty about it. So I think that the best thing that we can all do is once more, you know, like I mentioned, is, is to, you know, just get together, uh, unify as musicians and uh, just, you know, keep a positive attitude above all things. So with the cello itself, how did you come to choose the cello? Yes, uh, this is a question that I, that I get uh, asked quite often. Mm -hmm. And without sounding too cheesy, um, I think that the instrument chose me rather than, than the, uh, the opposite. Uh, I don't know, you know, I, I, it's the first instrument that I've, that I've ever played. Uh, and um, I think that whether it was the, the shape of the instrument, but particularly the tone, there was something very comforting about the uh, the tone of the instrument, and uh, as as some of your viewers and as you may know uh, already, the uh, cello has the closest range to the uh, to the human voice, so it has a, a pretty wide range that um, you know m makes it very easy to to play uh, lyrical passages. And so you know, I was always fascinated uh, since I was a little kid by the instrument and. Uh, um, yeah, I just kind of uh, fell in love with the with the instrument at a really, really early age. So to take that question even farther, uh, Fanfare Magazine praised you for uh, fast becoming known for your ability to combine virtuosity with intense, well thought out interpretations. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite subject as a musician. <laughs> Please share share with us your. Uh, you know your your attitude regarding in inventiveness or pioneering approaches in, in what you do yes and this is as a matter of fact a, a topic that i talk a lot in my in my lectures i teach a lot to my students uh, look uh, i think a lot of people get caught up with the uh, the two dimensional from a classical standpoint right you know we we have a two dimensional piece of paper that we we're constantly looking at we're looking at the notes we're looking at the uh, dynamics uh, so on and so forth but uh, you know an idea usually starts in a different kind of plane a different kind of let's just call it dimension right in in the mind of the composer and so I think that it's important for us artists to be able to uh, you know, in, in order to uh, interpret a particular a work of music, regardless of the genre, there's always going to be a, a historical um, backstory to that particular composition. I mean, the clay, in the case of uh, classical music, uh, oftentimes composers were influenced by uh, their uh, national identity, and uh, and oftentimes they were influenced by uh, you know uh, events that happened around the uh, the particular composer's life at a particular, uh, very precise time in in history. And so uh, you know one of the first things that I uh, that I like to do you know before I even uh, you know play a single note on the instrument is to look up the historical you know the historical side of of what I am about to play. Make sure that I am doing a thorough research and then I base my interpretations on that particular um, uh, research that is so important uh, that provides a, a means to coming up with an interpretation that not only is original but that it that potentially could be as close to what the composer um, possibly would have intended you know in, in, especially in classical music you know um, we don't have, the, the truth is that we don't have a time machine. So all that we have available are manuscripts, are, uh, you know, texts uh, that, uh, that are, you know, conversations written in text, uh, perhaps from a composer and a friend, uh, you name it. So, so, you know, we have to be able to uh, be aware of these, um, uh, you know, of, of this side of, of history in order to be able to, you know, convey or reinterpret essentially an idea that started in the composer's mind uh, and uh, was passed down into a, uh, you know, two-dimensional plane, and then convey it into a three-dimensional, three-dimensional setting through through performance. Tell us about, please, uh, when you you were growing up uh, in the education as you your formative years. Mm -hmm. As a child in the education there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, wh what are those avenues and, and how did that work out for you? 
Yeah, so I grew up in, in Venezuela in a, in a town called Valencia, which is um, an industrial town in, in Venezuela, um, just an hour and a half away from the capital, Caracas. And, uh, you know, Venezuela growing up um, underwent a, a massive, massive uh, particularly back in the day, a massive change in, in terms of how they looked at classical music and uh, particularly orchestral, orchestral uh, playing. And so uh, Venezuela uh, really expanded of, on the uh, concept of education. So uh, they really saw that uh, it was important for kids of all backgrounds and, and you know, very diverse uh, kids to, uh, to learn uh, how to play an instrument. And so that was a, um, uh, the, in, in turn, they created an environment of excellence, an environment that um, you know, was uh, as close as, as you can get to, you know, some of the best conservatory systems in, in Europe as well. You know, it's, 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 it's really the, uh, the uh, music system in Venezuela originated from the uh, European conservatory system. And so what that did is that it, it, it generated not only an interest for the instrument, uh, at least in, in me growing up, but uh, it also uh, generated an instrument to learn and to get to get better. Um, you know, some 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 of us that grew up in in, um, in in Venezuela in this kind of system also come from, um, you know, not the uh, the wealthiest kind of um, you know socioeconomic uh, conditions. And so, what what this uh, was able to provide, it was able to provide. Uh, young musicians with an avenue to succeed, with an avenue to find uh, a career path that no, not only was uh, creative, but uh, in my case, it allowed me to uh, travel all, all over the world, uh, you know, experience all, all kinds of different cultures, meet uh, all kinds of different people and make uh, a lot of great friendships. So I think that this was the most important contribution that uh, growing up in in uh, in a country like Venezuela and growing up in that kind of a musical system did for me and and my playing. I think that it instilled um, a, a great work ethic and uh, and and great values when it comes to when it comes to performance. So, considering your travels and your history of education, who are the people or things along the way that you've seen? Uh, that have influenced you or helped shape where you where you are now. You know, I see that you've spent, you have a lot of success in Asia, Latin America, U.S., etc. Well, funny enough, I one of the first things that I ever heard uh, on vinyl uh, was uh, essentially what my, my father was a, um, a, a collector of, of vinyl and particularly huge fan of music from the 80s, music from the 70s. And so I, I grew up uh, essentially listening to this, um, to this kind of music. And so- and Rock and uh, roll? Yeah, rock and roll, rock and roll, all kinds of other genres. So I, and, and that's actually a really, really important thing uh, for any kind of musician, not only if you're a classical musician or, or a, a rock and roll artist or a jazz player, I think that is, it's incredibly important to uh, expose uh, kids from an early age to diverse uh, you know, kinds uh, of, of music, diverse genres. Uh, that way you start developing your, your musical taste, what you like, what you don't like, uh, your sense of tone, your sense of uh, also virtuosity. For instance, I mean, I, I grew up listening to uh, Inbe Malmsteen. You know, he's, he's been, believe it or not, a great influence in, in my playing as well. I mean, just the sure. uh, virtuosity of, of a player like Malmsteen, Steve Vai, that's another, that's another great guitarist that I've, I've always admired. Joe Satriani, uh, Paul Gilbert, that's another one that, uh, you know, Paul. essentially uh the, the whole uh g3 tour crew and and uh, and other bands you know that that uh, have also believe it or not by by expanding my my um curiosity and, and my uh you know knowledge of music it has been able to also uh pay a, a very strong influence in my technique and developing my technique and uh and developing my musical taste um around a particular composition because you have to remember i mean you know the malpsteins the uh the vice of today you know those were uh, you know people back in the day in class 
classical music, quote unquote, they were doing exactly the same thing. Paganini, right. Alfredo Piatti, in, in the case of, of the cello, Bottesini for basses, you know? So, so uh, I think that people have a concept of uh, classical composers as these two-dimensional figures, right? Um, that we see in, in paintings uh, and, and, you know, and we, we kind of have in many ways dehumanized these, uh, these composers, but at the end of the day, uh, and performers back in the day, but at the end of the day, they were people just like you and I, you know, they went to sleep just like you right. and I, they, uh, they ate, uh, you know, uh, and, and so, and so, uh, you know, the more you start uh, expanding your knowledge and seeking for, you know, for, you know, a means to, to acquire as, as much knowledge as you possibly can, you start realizing that uh, human beings have, haven't really changed uh, that much, you know, since uh, <laughs> for years, right? For years and years and years. So back in the day, they had pen and paper and candles, and now we have iPads, but we're pretty much still doing the, uh, the, uh, the same thing. So on that subject, do you think that... Um... Uh, you know, there are a lot of string players that come from the, the pit that also play metal or whatever. Do you think you'll, you'll take a lap over in that direction one of these days, considering your interest in the, <laughs> the aforementioned? Well, I, I have. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, uh, not many people know this about, about me, but uh, I am a, a producer of electronic dance music. So electronic dance music actually has been a great influence as well in my, um, you know, musical upbringing. And I've produced uh, and composed several recordings in electronic music. I used to DJ uh, when I was younger, in my younger, in my younger days, when I was much skinnier and, <laughs> and uh, I'm much more energetic. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's always a possibility. And I, I, I get this asked a lot, you know, when are you going to do, when are you going to start making a, a recording, um, you know, of, of a different kind of genre, maybe um, doing something with electronics. And I've been really, really trying to uh, think about, uh, you know, about this particular recording, which I'm currently working on. And so hopefully in a couple of years, you, you, sh you will be able to uh, enjoy. And I will definitely let you know, you know, when the, uh, the recording comes out. Yeah. So I like yeah, it absolutely. when things evolve like that that's uh that'll be very interesting to hear um what are the things that happen in your off stage life or are there any that you carry on the stage with you I mean, well that's a uh that's a very um intricate question and and um, i think that what a lot of the next question <laughs> okay just kidding uh, <laughs> i think that uh you know, particularly for a, um, a person who is out in the, in the public figure, uh, what uh, most people see is the, you know, the accomplishments, the, uh, you know, the great things that uh, you see in, in the biographies that, you know, people talk about you and, and that's all great. But, uh, you know, um, the musician's career is, is not an easy career and uh, it takes a lot of hard work and and dedication and and with with music also comes a uh, you know for some easy for some other people who um might have not grown grown up in in a, a certain favorable condition um might post a, a series of of challenges and of course i have i've had a bit of uh, 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 you know a lot of um very very difficult and challenging experiences in my life, which are very, very personal, uh, very personal to me. But what that has done uh, for me as a, a performer is to be able to uh, experience every kind of uh, possible emotion that you could possibly imagine. And, and in turn, that has helped me to really understand from, a, from an emotional side, uh, when a composer is trying to convey a particular emotion, whether it is happiness or sadness or, you know, the, the loss of somebody that they, they, they loved in life, uh, you name it. And so I think that, that uh, my uh, life and the course of how my life has um, transpired uh, in my personal life has certainly also shaped me 
to be able to uh, better understand uh, and convey musically, uh, you know, what a particular set of emotions um, a composer is trying to convey. And I hope that that makes sense. It does. I think it, I think authenticity is a good word here, you know, uh, to have lived it enables a way to convey it. So I, absolutely. I, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, when you're rehearsing, this is for our, our friends who watch uh, the magazine, who mm. are in the learning stages. What are the things you think about when you, uh, as you rehearse? Well, as I rehearse and as I uh, practice, um, funny enough, I think that uh, one, one of the uh, articles about practicing, right, practicing techniques was published by Making Music magazine um, a couple of weeks to a month ago. Uh, but one of the things that I, I focus on, well, th there are three pillars in which a musician is always, um, uh, let's just call it reviewed, right, regardless of a of a genre that you're playing. So the, the first pillar is intonation. The second pillar is a sense of rhythm, a rhythmic sense. And then the, uh, the third pillar is um, um, uh, musicality. So one, two, and three, right? Uh, so when I am uh, practicing or when I am rehearsing, you know, I always have in, you know, in take into consideration these three main main pillars, um, particularly when it comes to rhythm. Uh, a lot of people, particularly uh, in, in, in the, uh, a lot of young students, they, they tend to really focus on intonation and, and, and musicality, but they might not focus so much on the rhythmical, uh, rhythmic aspects of, of music playing. So for that reason, uh, even at my stage and even at my age, you know, I still practice with a metronome. Um, uh, you, you're never going to be good enough uh, for a metronome, no, ma no matter what stage you are in, in your playing, it's, it's always good to kind of take a few steps back when you're practicing and, you know, have a little bit of humility and make sure that, um, you know, that you're using this great tool to your advantage. And I think that the metronome is quite possibly the best tool that a musician can have in, in their professional, professional life, in their professional career. Um, besides that, uh, you know, lots and lots of uh, slow work. Uh, I don't think that the general public realize how much work uh, it's involved in the uh, learning and, um, and shaping process of a particular composition, and, and particularly in classical music. Where you know, for us uh, classical musicians, we we are trained and and um, we undergo a a process of polishing to make sure that all the notes are there, to make sure that all the rhythms are there, that we're able to convey you know the uh, the the music as well on on stage, and to be able to do all these three um, you know essential uh, uh, pillars of, of of music and do them do them well. And, and for that reason, you know, it takes a lot of patient work and, and, you know, just lots and lots of slow work and slowly crafting and, you know, chipping away and, and shaping, shaping up your playing to be able to play, you know, a, a piece and make it look uh, easy. Make sense? Yes. Right. As a matter of fact, I would actually add the component to all of that of uh, the art of listening which is uh, the first thing I notice whenever I play with other people is if they're listening to the rest of the group or not. Um, you know, I'm not at the, the level of uh, being able to define an orchestra of everybody who's already at that level, but as I, or just for the fun of mingling with other musicians, jump in and jam, if you will, mm. I become very uninterested in those who aren't listening because well, you know, so what do you have to say about that? Do you talk about that when you are uh, Absolutely, teaching? absolutely. This is, you're kind of preaching to the choir here. I mean, this is, this is one of the things that I always talk about. Um, and, and, you know, as a classical musician, this is how you can also benefit from learning how to play in other genres, other styles. Uh, you know, jazz players, I have a lot of admiration for jazz players. Not only, uh, you know, they're going to be the best uh, music uh, theorists that you could possibly find. I mean, they Absolutely. have a really, really great solid concept of their theory, but uh, talk about great listeners, right? Uh, they're able to, you know, I mean, you know, they're able to listen to one, one another 
And, and, and really jazz, I think that it, it kind of trains your ear and it opens up your, uh, your ear to be able to listen to, uh, you know, all the intricacies, all the different kind of changes. Uh, and, and you have to be able to do it on the spot. There's an improvisational component to, to jazz that is very, very important. That involves uh, listening. So in classical music, uh, it's so important, particularly uh, when you're playing in, in large groups, whether it is orchestrally to you know, smaller chamber groups, such as quartets, uh, piano trios, sextets, I mean, you name it. Uh, you have to not only be aware as a performer of your own part, but uh, also be aware of the, the uh, complete score, what goes on around you at all times, to be able to listen to what uh, another musician, another fellow a colleague is doing, and to be able to react to those musical musical choices because remember uh, music at the end of the day is is a is a language without sounding again too cheesy but it really is a language and oftentimes in classical music or jazz or other genres what we're doing is we, when we're playing with different uh, people we're actually having a conversation and so you know you cannot have a, a conversation with somebody else if only one person is is talking all the time and the other person isn't uh, really um, <laughs> isn't really listening, right? Uh, and so for that too. for that uh, for that same uh, reason, uh, I strongly encourage, um, you know, uh, particularly my students, you know, to just get away from just reading what's on the page and to start really listening to one another and encourage them to also um, try and, and venture into other musical genres and listen to other musical genres you know you have to be a great listener as a musician above all things you have, you know, our ears are our best best tools so when you hit the stage they call your name you're walking up the steps what's going through <laughs> your mind at that point well um i would say that uh for the most part, lots and lots of excitement. Uh, lots and lots of excitement because, uh, at least for me or to, to me, uh, there is nothing greater in the world than just stepping on a really nice large stage and being able to play with the uh, full symphony behind you. I mean, just the adrenaline, just it, it, at least for me, just goes to the, uh, to the uh, top, you know, to the max. And I always compare it to uh it's, it's like the equivalent of at least to me of, of driving a really really fast you know supercar um i can't really describe it into words how it how it really really feels to to be able to, to have you know an opportunity to to be on stage and to play on stage uh in front of uh larger crowds but uh but you know i i, I usually get really really excited and so i usually have to calm myself down uh, before a particular uh, performance, just trying to, you know, I always try to keep my zen and try to, you know, lower the uh, the level of adrenaline that that uh, that goes on. But uh, you know, to me, playing playing like that is the greatest thing in the world. Cheers to that feeling. <laughs> Absolutely. Well said. Um, okay, so I read uh, the other day that when you were twenty. To 23 years old, you recorded six cello suites by Johann Sebastian Bach and Alfredo uh, Piatti's 12 Caprices for solo cello, which I believe makes you the youngest uh, person in the world to do that. Is that true? What, well, what, at, at, least, at least at that time, at that time, I'm sure, you know. Well, my question is one of ambition. Uh, a lot of people I know when they're 21, 22, 23 are thinking about something completely different than that. <laughs> <laughs> what made you well, uh, get, take on that burden of the size of that? <laughs> well, here's, here's the thing. I grew up, uh, like I explained, like I just you know, mentioned before, I grew up listening to recordings. So um, lots and lots and lots of recordings. So recordings uh, to me, uh, were essentially my my books. You know, I, I love the time where we used to, you know, go to a, a physical store and actually flip through, you know, flip through those those records. And you you, you would have the uh, the guy at the counter with really long hair, you know, <laughs> piercings, and you would ask him, hey, you know, what do you think? Uh, 
which which concerto do you think would which uh, version of the concerto do you like the best and they would say well i actually appreciate the london symphony's uh you know version of this particular uh, concerto or or a symphony versus you know the berlin philharmonic so you know i i grew up with uh with those days you know and a little bit of vinyl so i i've, I've always had a great passion for uh recording and um and uh, and so that kind of powered my um uh, this uh, thing in me that i've always wanted to uh, record the, the the cello suites and, and the piatis and for for us cellists it, I don't think that it, it gets any any better than than these two sets of um, of works, uh, particularly the Piatti Caprices. I mean, for cellists, th these are really really uh, grueling, uh, uh, you know, uh, sets of sets of pieces that are highly virtuosic. Again, Piatti Alfero Piatti for us cellists is the equivalent of of uh, Paganini for violinists. And so, you know, I, I've always uh, figured that if, if I could, you know, record these two, these two, um, you know, th these two uh, works, uh, that, that uh, at least internally, you know, it, it gave me a, a great sense of, of accomplishment as a, as a cellist and, a, and as a musician, because it, it made me feel that I was worth uh, while uh, playing uh, other other pieces, you know that that would be just just as as intricate and and the uh, the process for recording those those pieces also the way that I did it was very I mean it kind of made things a little bit more difficult for myself. Um, that's how how crazy I, I tend to be at times, right? But you get uh, those, a job here. The, the those those recordings. Uh, <laughs> Those those recordings were done without any editing. Uh, I always admired. I, I I grew up listening to the old older generation of of players. You know, from the forties, uh, the high fits. Um, you know, Joshua High fits, uh, Pablo Casals, um, Paul Tartemier, In the case for us, cellist, Paul. Uh, you know, Pierre Fournier, uh, and and these guys could play. You know, back in the day, they could play, and and they didn't have the uh, the ability you know when you hear those recordings uh they're just sitting down and they're just playing you know from beginning to end they, there is no uh no cheating involved there's there's nothing else except for the cello and the orchestra and the conductor in that in that instance or in this instance of casals who uh also you know famously um, uh, recorded the uh, the six cello suites and repopularized them for us cellists and as a matter of fact, I, I come from that lineage of Pablo Casals as well in my cellistic uh, oh. tree. So uh, I always admire that these uh, performers back in the day could do this. And, uh, and, I, and I always figure, you know, like if, I, if I'm able to do this uh, as a cellist, then I can do anything else, anything else uh, afterwards. And so, you know, that's I think uh, and I always wanted to record them I always wanted to play the I, I always had a great affinity for the, uh, the the six cello suites again because of that um, lineage that comes all the way from from Casals and uh, particularly from uh, with the Alfredo Piatti um, caprices uh, I come from three different branches and cellistically speaking they all they all uh, uh, funnel down to to Alfredo Piatti. So essentially, Alfredo Piatti taught a student, and then a, that student taught another student, and then another student, and then we get to to uh, to me, cellistically speaking, right? And so it all kind of funnels to to these two, at least in my cellistic um, uh, genealogical tree, uh, it funnels down to Pablo Casals and Alfredo Piatti much much uh, earlier than Casals of course. Neat. So what you keep talking about recording uh, with these pieces that we're discussing did you record those? I see that I have a you have a recording uh, studio of your own it looks like. Um, yes. Do you use the recording studio for the the uh, for the uh, dance stuff that you referred to or did you do those in your studio as well or did you they take you into another studio with somebody else producing? I mean, so, you... so a couple of uh, so there are a couple of recordings that uh, so for my electronic dance music, um, if, if that's what you're you're referring to, yeah, uh, 
I, so I, I actually founded an electronic music, uh, dan uh, an electronic dance music label, really, really small label that I founded in, in Ohio. And uh, so I, I, I had my base of operations in, in Ohio along with, uh, you know, my, my studio that I, that I had there, which is still, you know, I, I still have it. So a lot of these uh, uh, recordings uh, were done in that particular studio. Then there were some recordings that were done at different, different studios and different parts. So, so uh, you know, just a variety of different, different places. Do you throughout, like, do you like producing engineering? There. Do you like to absolutely, do that? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I, I absolutely love it. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I compare, I compare it to the equivalent of playing a video game. At least for, for me, you know, it's just incredibly relaxing uh, to me, and, and it's just plain fun. I mean, who doesn't, who doesn't like playing around with, with music and coming up with, you know, all kinds of weird ideas and, right. and interesting ideas as well. So yeah, I, I you know, I have made a, also a career as a, as a producer and particularly as a producer in, in several genres, but my main focus of course has been classical and electronic dance music because, uh, you know, that's what kind of uh, motivates, has been motivating me for, for years uh, personally. But um, I also work with a, a series of, of of producers under my label that uh, they're able to produce, uh, you know, all kinds of different genres as well. And 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 again, I, I we go back to that that concept of being able to, as a musician, being able to uh, expand your knowledge with with other, you know, to other musical musical genres be, besides just classical. Uh, I think that is incredibly beneficial, and from a compositional standpoint. Uh, you know, it's it's great, you know, to be able to, you know, to to produce or compose a particular, you know, a particular um, album or a particular song in, in 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 different genres. I think that it's incredibly rewarding as a musician. All right, the last thing I want to talk about, please, uh, relates to the first thing we talked about, and that is. Um, you know, you were saying that uh, in regard to your humility, uh, you are a person first and a musician second. And so when I look at your track record, you're very ambitious, very prolific. And uh, it makes me think, you know, how the world is full of great musicians. Mm -hmm. some, some you hear about, some you don't. Some succeed mm -hmm. more than others. You know, talk about the, 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 those aspects of you know, uh, the ambition and the human side of uh, the work ethic and, and that, because I, I, I think a lot of people think that you get good at your instrument. Mm. Somebody comes out of the sky, finds you and puts you up there and everything is happy ever after. And you get all this money and jets and that's it. Mm. And that's, that's right. the illusion to us. You know, the magician knows the trick that they don't see you know, please talk about, you know, those ethics as they, as they apply to your life. I, I think that this is actually a very, very, very good question. Uh, and a, um, a topic that I actually had to find out for myself the hard way, right? And as, as many, many of us and many musicians, right? We, we just think, well, you know, at the beginning, uh, well, you know, if I get really, really good at this particular thing, then, you know, the, the doors of heaven are going to uh, open up and I'm going to see St. Peter and all the saints. Uh, yeah, uh, look, there is a, an element of, of luck and there is a, an element of hard work involved in this. And what I mean by luck, uh, I kind of like to divide it into two different different branches right there are those who are born in in very lucky circumstances you know there, there might be those who are born in a musical family and they have uh their parents have all the necessary connections you know to kind of connect them and, and push them into the uh, the musical world and that's great that's absolutely there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever there are those who come from you know a completely uh different um uh, side of, of things in life where, you know, they have to essentially make their own luck uh, uh, and, and make their own, their own career. Those who might not be as, 
um, might not come from a musical family, might not come from, you know, certain, um, you know, living circumstances and have to work uh, maybe twice, three times as, as hard as other others who, who have had that opportunity. And there's nothing wrong, you know, there's nothing wrong with either or. Uh, the, the important thing is that you're able to get there. And so how do you get there? There is no other way of of, of, of doing this, but with a great dedication, great work and, uh, and just, you know, and just grinding through and, and, uh, you know, even myself, you have no, you know, again, we go back to, uh, you might see my biography and you might see, you know, all the great things that, that maybe I have accomplished right at, at my age. But what, what you're, what you're not seeing is the amount of people that told me no, uh, all the time. Right. And, and all the no's that I was, uh, that I that I had to kind of battle through and just swim through, you know, a sea of of rejection. And so I think that also as a musician, and and this also goes for anybody in the in the arts, right? In 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 the arts world, uh, you know, in order to be able to achieve success, you have to be not only a great, uh, you, you have to achieve a level of greatness. Um, in, in anything that, that you are doing, but you also need to be able to um, develop a very thick skin and, and, uh, and ignore, you know, all the, uh, all the negativity and just push through the negativity and just find, find, find your way. And at the same time, you have to be, a, particularly as a musician, you have to be savvy, you know, and, and, and all of these three things, three components have to kind of be balanced. You know, there are those who are really, really savvy individuals, you know, who, you know, they just have all the ambition in the world, but they're lacking in the greatness aspect. They're lacking on the practicing. They're like, they just think that just by, you know, putting on their business hat, you know, they're able, they, they will be able to, to get from point A to point B. And, and that's not how it works. You know, I think that in life, uh, regardless what you, what you want to achieve, whether it is you want to be a football player and, or a, or a basketball player and reach the NBA or, you know, be a musician and uh, reach a certain level of, you know, of, of recognition. Uh, you have to work hard. You have to be able to work hard and make really smart choices and, and uh, be very strategic, you know, with the, uh, the, the, the choices that you're making in life, particularly for those students. You know, and I teach this uh, to my, uh, you know, to my college students here at, 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 at Belmont University, where I teach, that you know you, you you not only have to be able to you know be savvy, but to be able to be great uh, and be able to have a a balance, you know. And so that's I think my my best advice, uh, and and certainly something that has uh, worked uh, for me personally. Um, and, and again, you know, with, with this also comes that, uh, that aspect of, of humility too, you know, to be able to kind of analyze yourself from a, a different perspective and be able to kind of, you know, look at yourself and ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? What are aspects that maybe can change? Where can I diversify? Where can I improve upon my technique? Where can I improve, you know, and constantly seek uh, ways of improving. Look, I'm um, um, uh, um, I've reached the level of, of playing uh, that, uh, that many people, you know, know about now, but I still look for ways of improving myself, even at my age. So it never ceases to, uh, to stop, you know, I'm always constantly learning and learning. And I'm also learning as I teach, you know, as a, as a, as a university professor, uh, you know, the, the learning process is not only one, one way, it's, it's a two way, two way string, you know, I learn how to become a better teacher, I learn th more things about myself. And so we're all in this kind of process of bettering ourselves and, you know, reaching, you know, new and better heights and climbing up that, you know, that, that wall of greatness, you know, that never ceases to, to stop. Very good. Well, I certainly appreciate your in, your insight and uh, you know sharing that with us. So, uh, uh, thanks again for coming by and uh, visiting with us. Uh, we wish you a lot of success and stay busy. I hope you'll stay in touch with us. Absolutely. And, uh, thank you again for all your time. It was it was very nice meeting you, and uh, all the best to you. 
Absolutely. And nice to meet you as well. And please stay healthy and safe. Okay. <laughs> yes, we sure will. All right. Be Take well. care.